we were, we were in the Gospel of uh, John in chapter 4. Let's continue there. So let's open up to John chapter 4. We're, gonna, uh, we're finally coming to the end, obviously, of what we've been talking about in regards to uh, Jesus and his conversation uh, with the Samaritan woman at the well. So we're at the end of that conversation now. But there's just something I want to I point out here, and it's just kind of like a supplement to that study that we've been doing. Uh, before we get into the Life of Christ Challenge Lesson 18, where we start to look at some different aspects of Jesus' early ministry, his uh, miracles and uh, things that were taking place. Because if you remember, when we started John chapter 4, right, we said that he was leaving his Judean ministry and he was entering into a Galilean ministry. But there was a pit stop along the way, and that pit stop was the Samaritans, right? And uh, where he met with the Samaritan woman, he, met, he stayed there for a couple days, uh, and there's something that I, I absolutely love about the story about, of the Samaritan woman, as well as the Samaritan people. And I'll point this out to you before we move any further, because it's something that, well, I think it's crucial for us today to understand. Because are there, are there people today who are, have their minds and their hearts open still to the Word of God? Are there people out there who are still searching? Right? People are searching for a better way. They're searching for hope. They're searching for, for something greater than themselves. Right? And so we know that if we, if we watch the news and we listen to all the pundits, right, that you would think that the world's given up on God, and that the world's given up on Christianity, but it's just not the case. Right? Now, there are still people who are still searching. And what I love about the Samaritan woman, she goes back in that conversation Jesus had with, them, uh, had with her, she goes back to the people, right? She, she, when Jesus tells her to call her husband, right, and then they have that little brief conversation and it starts to become uncomfortable, all of a sudden she, she leaves her water pot behind. She forgot she came to get the water, leaves the water pot behind, and hightails it home. Do you remember what she said to the people when she got home? What did she say? Diane? Yeah. Come see a man who knows everything I've ever done. Could this be the Messiah? Could this be the Christ? What I love about that story is <clears throat> she goes back, people come because of, of what she said, but when they get there, they hear Jesus. Jesus teaches, he preaches, and these people, they hear him, and they, they like what he has to say so much. They say, hey, can you stay a couple days? And Jesus says, yeah, I can stay a couple days with you. And it says at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the conclusion of this conversation and this story, the people say, you know, we came because of what you said. But we don't believe because of what you said. We now believe because we heard his teachings. And we believe him to be the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Well, you know what's important about that story? How many miracles did Jesus do? How many people did he raise? How many people did he heal as far as from sickness? Right now, there was the there was one aspect. I guess you could call it a miracle, and I don't really call it a miracle. It was just it really just identified who Jesus was, and that's the fact that Jesus could read your heart and mind, right? But he does that throughout his entire ministry, so it really wasn't anything out of the ordinary. It was just showing that she originally thought Jesus was just some common Jew. Common Jews don't have right the. Uh, the, the, the respect for the Samaritans, but they definitely don't interact with the Samaritans, especially a, a Jewish man with a Samaritan woman, definitely no there, and they absolutely don't drink from the same vessels because that would, they would have thought they would have become ritually unclean to drink, of, to drink of a vessel of a, of a woman who was unclean. And so at the end of the day, how many miracles did Jesus perform? When, they, when all the Jewish people from town were coming, it doesn't list one miracle, but they heard Jesus teach, they heard him preach, and they said, we now believe because we have heard for ourselves. They didn't say we believe because we've seen for ourselves, but we've heard for ourselves. Well, in the supplement to today's study, uh, or, or to the last couple weeks' study, fulfilling our ministry as Christians is crucial. So let's open up to John chapter 4, verse 34 through 38. And I want you to see what this has to say here. Because in John chapter 4, 34 through 38, notice what the words are here. <clears throat> and Jesus said to them, his apostles, right? They brought back food. Jesus says, my food is to do the will of, of him who had sent me 
and to accomplish his work. Before I go any further, what is your will? What is, what is your requirement in the Lord? Right? Jesus just said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. Well, what is your food? To do the will of him who sent you. Well, who sent you? Christ. Who sent Christ? The Father. And Jesus tells us in John 12, as I've mentioned to you guys many times since I've been here, and it tells them in that section of Scripture, I don't speak of my own initiative. Jesus said, so he said, I didn't just come here and make it up as I went along. He says, no, the Father's given me commandments as to what to say and what to speak. And he says, I do exactly as the Father has commanded me. So here in verse 34, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. How is that any different what Jesus says to what a Christian's duty is? Is our will, is our duty to do the will of God? Is our duty to do all that and to accomplish all the work of the Lord, right? All the work that he has given us? So the question then would become, what is the work he's given us? Raise our hands. What is the work that God has given you as a Christian man and woman? Sherry. Seek and save the lost. Seek and save the lost. Sherry, how do we seek and save the lost? Yep. Going out, talking to friends and family about the gospel of Jesus Christ, Diane. And to be prepared. Be prepared. Be prepared. To have an answer. Yeah, be prepared to have an answer. Isn't there a reason why 2 Timothy 2 and 15 says study to do what? Show yourselves approved unto the Lord. Study to show yourselves approved unto the Lord, right? What's the purpose of studying to show yourself approved? So you'll have an answer. In the, in the time in which you're having a conversation with somebody. You know one of the saddest parts of, of, of dealing with many Christians today? They don't have very many answers. How can you bring people to the Lord? How can you teach them the gospel? What is the gospel? It's the good news. How can you teach somebody the good news of Jesus Christ if you don't even know what the gospel is? You'd be surprised. And I know here we have, uh, in, in our congregation, there's a depth of knowledge in our congregation, right? And we have some really good men and women who could evangelize and who could, who could teach the scriptures. But I want to challenge you to do something this week. Go to people you know, friends or family, right? Co-workers maybe, who are claimed to be Christians. And I just want you to ask them a simple question. What is the gospel? And I want you to hear the myriad of answers that you're going to receive. Many people who claim Christ, they don't even know what the gospel is. So I want you to, let's do a little survey this week. Over this next week, just ask people a simple question. You don't have to get into a deep theological conversation, but just simply ask them, what is the gospel? Are you going to say something? 90%, well, 99% of the people I work with have no idea. Yeah, have no idea. And so you'd be surprised how many people claim Christianity. Now, when I say claim Christianity, I'm not talking about how the Bible defines what a Christian is. I'm just talking about Christian dumb, right? It could be anybody. If you claim Christ as your Lord and Savior, ask them, what is the gospel? And I want you to do this little survey question and hear the, all the many different answers that you'll receive. So we look at this and now continue on John 4, 34 through 38. In verse 35 it says, Do you not say that there are yet four months, and then comes the harvest? Behold, but I say to you, lift up your eyes, look on the fields. They are already white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages, and is gathering fruit for eternal life, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case the saying is true, one sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap for that which you have not labored. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. So I want us to break down this passage of Scripture before we move on. Because it's, it's truly very important to understand our ministry. So we have, in context of the story that we've been covering for a couple weeks, the woman goes back to her, her town, right? Goes back to her village. And she says, come see a man who's told me all things I've ever done. So you get to verse 35. 
You say that in four months, then comes the harvest. But he says, Jesus says, but I say, behold to you. Lift up your eyes. Look at the fields. They're already ripe for harvest. What is Jesus talking about in context of John chapter 4? He's talking about the Samaritans, right? They are the harvest, right? The, the fields are white unto harvest. These people came doing for what purpose? To get answers. They came to search. They came with an open heart and open mind based on the woman saying, hey, this man's told me all things I've ever, I've ever done. So they go to him, and they want to hear. They went at the behest of the woman, but then once they get to Jesus and they hear, they say, you know, we came because of what you said, but we now believe because of what we have heard. So how important is it for a Christian to be able to know how to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? How important is it for a Christian to know what the gospel is. To be able to tell somebody why it's good news. Right? If you don't know what the good news is, how can you share it with somebody? And if you don't know what the good news is, how can you believe in it? Lewis? Sometimes we fear the gospel. I think we do, because we see the first four chapters of the New Testament, and we got to know all this stuff before we go out and preach the gospel. All four, what's in the gospel? We got to come up with some basics for yourselves. How a basic guide for you to explain the gospel to someone in two minutes, yeah. five minutes. So you're comfortable. It's just the beginning. The gospel is not going to be preached all to that one person that day. Yeah. It might work that day, but we got to not fear that we got to know everything that's in the gospel before we go out and preach the gospel. Yeah. You, you think about it. Go ahead, Diane. I mean, yeah. they have no hope. They, they're living day-to-day -day existence, and we have the good news of yeah. bringing them that there's hope. Yep. That more than this life. Somebody answer me the question right now. What's good about the news? Hope of salvation. Hope of salvation. It's hope of saving. Hope of salvation. Hope of saving. What else? Before there's hope of salvation, you got to know something before that. It does the same. Hold on. Let's raise our hands. Jesus, Gina? Huh? huh? You got to believe, right? Well, belief is important. Faith comes from hearing, hearing from the Word of God. Bro, uh, Lewis? There's a Savior. There's a Savior. That's, that's where it all begins, right? The good news is Jesus Christ. Go ahead. I remember Wasam talking about, can you imagine being raised in a country, and he's raised in Baghdad, in a place where there was no hope of Christ, there was no love. Yeah. Love, they didn't know love. Yeah, you know, you know what's magical about uh, a couple weeks ago, whatever it was now, a couple uh, Sunday mornings ago, when John and, and Tyler uh, did their lessons. What was magical about what John and those who were with him were doing in Ghana? They were bringing people hope. Do you think there was a need for hope Amen. where he was? Do you think there was a need for something that was bigger and better and something that was greater than themselves? I you see, I think in times of turmoil, people are more receptive to the gospel, to the truth. Times of turmoil? Yeah. Because when you're in turmoil, things get real simple. Yeah. Survival. What happens to me? Yeah. Not just next year. You, you live one day at a time. Yep. I think those people in Africa, for the most part, live one day at a time. Mm -hmm. They draw their water. They find their food. Life is very simple. Yep. Who remembers what I preached on last week? I know some of you were distracted. But who remembers what I preached on last week? It was unrighteousness. I'll give you a hint. It was unrighteousness. But in the context of what I preached on last week, do you remember what I said that was crucial? I said... That we need to hunger and thirst for righteousness. What does hunger and thirst, spiritually speaking, imply? Desire. Roxanne. Desire. 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 But even more than desire, desperation. Remember I said 
There's not really many of us in America who have really ever truly, in the truest sense of the word, hunger and thirsted for anything. Who here didn't have any uh, access to water this morning? <clears throat> who here didn't have any access to some form of food? Now, you may have chosen not to eat it, but did you have access to some form of food this morning? So you had shelter, you had, you were wearing clothing, right? You had access to food, you had access to water. And so I say all that to say, how many of us, right, when we think about hungering and thirsting for righteousness, it's, it, there's a form of desperation there, right? So as we look at the context of this kind of supplemental study to what uh, the, the, the conversation is and the story of the woman at the well in John chapter 4, I want you to look over to 1 Peter for a second. Hold your place in John because we'll be going back. But we're going to bounce around for a second. I want you to see something here. All Christians have a ministry. And I want you to be able to connect what Jesus is teaching and what he, what he accomplished in, in John chapter 4 with the Samaritan people. I want you to, comp, I want you to see uh, what our ministry is. So in 1 Peter chapter 2, I want you to look at verse 5. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5. Notice what it says. You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now look at verse 9. But you. Who's you? Christians. But you, Christians, believers, you're a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possessions. So why? So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his everlasting light. So think about what Jesus or, or what Peter's telling us through the Holy Spirit there. And then you, when you think back to what we just heard, uh, what Jesus was saying in John chapter 4, 34 and 35, he says, I tell you, lift up your eyes. Look upon, look upon the fields. They are white unto harvest. And then you hear what Peter has to say. You are living stones being built up as a spiritual house, a holy priesthood. To do what? Offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable unto the Lord. What does it mean to offer spiritual sacrifices unto the Lord? Did I see it? I'm sorry? Prayer. Prayer. That's one. Okay. Uh, Mike? It works. Works, absolutely. Lewis? Obedience to his word. Obedience to his word. Do you guys remember last week when I, oh, Gina? Submitting yourself to the Lord, right? And I love the idea of submission because if you submit unto the Lord, you're going to do what? You're going to do some of the good works. You're going to offer up prayers. You're going to do all that God requires of you. Did Jesus Christ submit unto the Father? And does the scriptures tell us that during his submission unto the Father, he did all things that were commanded of him, right? And so that's how he was able to fill all that was prophesied about him, all that was spoken about the Messiah in the law, the Psalms, and the prophets, right? So when we look to answer the question, what is it to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through, uh, through Christ? It's we offer our obedience. That's what righteousness is. We know righteousness just means you become right unto God, right? That's what makes you righteous, because you submit to his moral standards. And now you not only submit to his moral standards, but you actually then, the works, you do what's required of you. Well, we have examples of Jesus praying. We have examples of his apostles and his disciples going out two by two to do what? Spread the gospel. To, to actually uh, teach, to go out ahead of Jesus into the villages, to do what? Say, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Why do you think that before they said the message, they used the word repent? Who was, Je who did the, who was Jesus and his disciples sent to? The sinners. The sinners, but there's a specific group of sinners. The to Israel, Israel, right? He sent them to the Jews. The Jews already believed in God. So what's the first thing they needed to do? Turn back to him. Turn back to the God that you already believe in. So you have to repent. 
What did John the Baptist say? What was the beginning of John's message? Repent. Why? Because they were already believers. Now you've got to turn yourself around, turn away from sin, and go back unto the Lord. Go back unto the Lord to do what? To submit yourself back to his moral standards. That's what righteousness is. So Jesus is telling us here, back in John chapter 4 now, in verse 30, uh, 34 and 35, he says, look, the fields are already ripe unto harvest. And he says, already he who reaps, in verse 36, is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life. What does it mean, already he who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit unto eternal life? Don't think in the physical sense, but think in the spiritual sense. What does that mean? Well, when we were kids, we'd call it adding stars to our crown. Okay, adding stars to our crown. What? Where does that crown come from? Heaven, from the Lord, from God, right? If you hear the uh, words, well done, my good and faithful servant, you're going to receive a crown of life. So adding, what, jewels to the crown, so to speak, right? And so we know that you're storing up blessings unto the Lord. And so a couple other things that I want to look at here is that as we follow the example of Jesus, we want to seek and save that which is lost, so we turn to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 19, please. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, we see a very simple statement here, but I also want you to just kind of keep this in context with what we're talking about this morning and the supplemental study about how we can look at what Jesus did with the Samaritans and ask ourselves, how is what we're called to do any different than what Jesus did? In Luke chapter 19 and in verse 10, Jesus tells us, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. The Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Brother, there are three basic fundamental attitudes that all Christians must have. All Christians must want to accomplish the work of God. That's what we just seen in John this morning. John chapter 4 and verse 34. I have food to eat in which you do not know of. Right? And so we must have a servant mentality. Where does the idea of having a servant mentality come from? Example of Christ. Example of Christ. Example of Christ. I want you to now flip your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew. In everything we do, Jesus is our example. Amen? Amen. And if Jesus is our example... How closely do we follow that example? In Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28, notice what Jesus says. Matthew 20 and verse 28. Jesus tells us, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. I wonder how many of us read the scriptures. I wonder how many of us read the scriptures, understand that we're to be a servant of the King of Kings, and how often do you serve? How do you serve? What makes up your service? Have you ever thought about that? Lewis? And then Ed, you'll be next. Sometimes we let ourselves off the hook when we say, well, I'm a Christian, because like I said, it's a generic term that those who believe in denomination, everybody is a Christian. But when we start looking at, looking at ourselves as priests, Yep. We are priests, we are saints. I'm teaching a Bible study and Catholic and said, Oh no, saints are people that, you know, no, you're a saint. No, mm -hmm. I can't be a saint. I'm not pure. I said, No, saint, we're priests. We're here to serve. Yep. We were created for good works. And sometimes we forget that. Amen. Christianity doesn't express that thought of God. Yeah. And that's why, you know, Randy and I, we've talked many times about Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, right? Aren't we to offer our lives up as a living and holy sacrifice unto the Lord? Yeah. Right? Well, that comes from our priesthood. Who offered up the sacrifices? The priests. Yeah. What are you? A priest. And um, part of the message, not only in these uh, scriptures that we're looking at about uh, Jesus and the, and the good news, part of the message is uh, the world is lost. Yeah. And, and, and part of the job is to convince them 
even today, that they're lost. They don't know it. Yeah. And so that's part of, you've got to get there first. Yeah. You, they don't realize that they're lost. Yeah. They think everything's fine. They think everything's fine. And that's why Jesus says, you say four months comes the harvest. He says, spiritually speaking, lift up your eyes. The harvest is ready. Jim? Uh, I was just kind of thinking, like, to, to piggyback on Ed's comment. In the Old Testament, what was the priest for? Right? Yeah, and yes, there was, you know, various sacrifices and rituals and, and yep. things that were assigned to them. But, you know, the, the sinful people, there was a barrier between them and God. Yep. They needed that priest who had then been sanctified, gone through the ritual of purity, to, to be the thing that connected that sinful people back to God. And so now, moving forward into the New Testament, we have Jesus as our great high priest. So then we have that role as a priest. We have yeah. direct access to God. Yeah. The people back then did. But we're put in the position of the priest, which means we're supposed to be going out into the world, yeah. finding those sinful people, and being their connection back to God. Because today yeah. is a barrier between them and God. Isn't it a blessing that we don't have to offer sacrifices like the Jews? Now, they offered up physical sacrifices. We offer up spiritual sacrifices, right? What was it about the sacrifice that the Jews offered up that actually brought atonement? It was the blood. And do you know why it was the blood? Because Jesus, God, tells us that the life was in the blood. So they offer the blood. That's why we're commanded in Scripture to not what? Eat the blood. To drink the blood. Why? Because it's, it's, it's by reason of the life, right? Uh, the, it's by reason of the blood that the life is in the blood, right? What happens if I was to drain all my blood? I die. You guys ever heard of somebody called George Washington? I hope you heard of George Washington if you're an American citizen, right? I mean, that's going back, you know, back to elementary school, right? George Washington died. You know why? Because he was sick. And they thought, well, his blood must be bad. Bloodletting. Well, back then, they did, as Lewis said, they, did, they practiced something called bloodletting. They, they would drain some of your blood. Well, man had a little too much of his blood drained, and he perished. They didn't have the transfusions like we have today, right? And so there is the reason for the sacrifice or is that the life is in the blood. So you look at all this, and that's a little side fact, but we look at all of this information. Now look over to uh, Philippians. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 through 26. Again, we must have a servant mentality. And I want you to hear what the Apostle Paul had to tell to the people of Philippi in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, uh, 21 through 26 we'll look at. Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 through 26, that to live is to Christ. And he tells us in verse 21, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Well, I would agree with that, right? Why is it to die is gain? To be with God. Gina? Yes. Right. How often do we talk about uh, faith, right? Or belief, trust, and then obedience is biblical faith. You trust in the promises of God. Well, what does the Bible tell us? That you can know that you are saved. And so as Gina says, heaven, right? You look at there, it says, it says to live uh, is Christ, to die is gain. Because you receive what you've been working toward, what you've been hoping for. And he says in verse 22, but if I am to live on in the flesh, this will mean faithful labor for me. And I do not know which, which to choose. But I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart, and be with Christ, for that is much better, obviously, than what I'm doing now and where I'm at. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary, not for my sake, but for your sake. Why was it more necessary for Paul to stay in the flesh, not for his own sake, but for your sake, meaning the people that he was writing to? To continue to teach. To continue to teach. Why? Because there's lots of lost souls. The harvest is ripe. The harvest is it's ripe, uh, it's white, and it's ready for, 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 uh, for reaping. But if we don't have anybody reaping, who's going to bring in the harvest? So you look at what he's telling us here, verse 23, but I am, uh, verse 24. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. 
Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that your uh, proud confidence in me may abound in Christ Jesus through my coming to you again. You can see how Paul has the mindset, has the attitude of a servant. Now look at chapter 2 of Philippians. David, in chapter yep. verse 27, it's important too. He kind of sums it up in that chapter in Philippians. And in verse 27 it says, Only conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or remain absent, I will hear of, I will hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. And that is what our spiritual sacrifices are. That we're doing the work of the Lord and we're doing it consistently. Now look at chapter 2 in verse 3 and 4. And again, this goes back to Christ being our example. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceits, but with humility of mind regard one another as more important than yourselves. And do not merely look out for your own personal matters, but also for the interest of others. Well, how does, how does that passage coincide with what we're talking about this morning? You guys know any Christians who are a little bit too busy to be Christians? You guys know anybody who are a little bit too busy to do the things that God calls them to do? To seek and save lost souls? Maybe to even pray? Or to worship? Worship! Isn't it funny how we, on, on Sunday morning, we have 120 to 130 people for a worship service? We don't have a third of that here this morning. People might be a little bit too busy for Bible study. Well, it's been a long week. That's an extra hour of sleep I could get. Does that make sense in the context of what we're talking about, right? People need to know who they are in Christ. They need to know who they are and what our mission is, what our responsibility is. Randy? My father used to call that majoring in the minors. Majoring in the minors, absolutely. Emphasis on the wrong things. Yep. And not subjecting yourself to the will of the Lord. Absolutely. So as we look at this information here this morning, we recognize that God has given each of us jobs to do and abilities to do these jobs. Flip over to the gospel, or not gospel, the book of Romans. Chapter 12, I want us to look at the first eight verses of chapter 12. Oftentimes we focus on the first two verses. I want us to focus on the first eight verses this morning, though. So we recognize that God has given each of us a task and abilities to do those tasks. So in Romans chapter 12, notice what the scriptures tell us. Romans chapter 12, we're going to read verses 1 through 8. Notice what the scriptures tell us here. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. He's telling you that as a disciple of Jesus Christ, it's your duty. Verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renewing of your mind with what? With what the pundits have to say on the, on the national news networks? No. Renewing your mind with what God has to say. For God is our leader. God is, our, is the one that we turn to. And so, transform by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Oftentimes, we look at those two verses without going any further. But notice what it says in verse 3 and following. For through the grace given to me, I say to you, everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, and God, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and not all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually we're members of that one body. So we, or, or verse 6, so we have uh, gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us in exercising uh, them accordingly, if prophecy, according to the proportion in his faith, if uh, service in, in serving, uh, he who teaches and is teaching, he who exhorts in his exhortation, 
Uh, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. What is the point of looking at those different uh, aspects of different uh, works and or different abilities or, and or different gifts? What is the point of what he was trying to tell the people of Rome in those eight verses? Steve? We need to recognize what our gifts are. Yeah. Because many of us think we don't have the gifts. Yeah. And if we don't recognize what we can do, someone needs to point out what our gifts are. Yeah. We may not recognize it. Somebody say, you know, you can do this. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that you say that because it makes me think back all the way to my days when I came out of Catholicism into the Lord's Church and I met, you know, guys like Jerry McKinney and others I often <laughs> tell you guys about. They were my mentors, right? They were the ones that helped raise me up in the Lord. John Crapel, Larry Anderson, there's uh, 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 Rick Gilmer, there's, there's, there's plenty of them, right? And I go back and I think about what these men had to say and I, I remember we were talking about gifts one day and, and, and I said, you know, I... I'm still trying to figure out what my gift is. And Jerry says, you know, he goes, I already know what your gift is. And it was a Friday night. And you know what I did back in those days? I had Friday night fellowship. We did it every Friday. And J Jerry said, your gift's a gift of hospitality. <laughs> Why? He says, because you open up your home every week. And we have studies. And we encourage one another. And you give us an opportunity to gather as the saints in, in our homes. And he was telling me, as a young Christian man who's trying to figure out maybe what my gift was, he said, Dave, you got the gift of hospitality. And I, never, I would never have necessarily thought about it that way, unless somebody who was more mature than me in the faith had, men, had, had, had mentioned that. So then it gets back, and I have a couple hands here, but it gets back to then understanding is, as you're younger and more, less mature in your faith, it's sometimes harder to see what maybe your ability and or gift is. And that's why mentorship, having our women mentor our younger women and our, uh, our men uh, mentoring our younger men to help them to come to a deeper knowledge, not only of the scriptures, but who they are and possibly even what their gifts are. I've seen uh, Lewis and then Randy. Our gift should grow. In other words, yeah, you're a good hospitality man, but your real gift is preaching. Yep. Yeah, you couldn't see that connection from being yep. hospitality to preach. There's no connection yeah. there. What we tend to do is and think that we have to do a retirement plan with the Lord. It isn't. Yeah. You just do this to your die. And I don't have nothing to do. I, I can't. You can. As long as you're breathing, you can do something. Yeah. And that, when we submit or humble ourselves to him, we'll find a talent. God's yeah. put us to work. We'll find a talent. And what Lewis is saying is true. I do have a gift of, of preaching and teaching. Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing here before you. But you know what's funny? When he told me I had the gift of hospitality, that was like... That was probably six, seven years before I ever even thought about preaching, right? Preaching wasn't on the radar. I remember when I, I went to a men's, uh, uh, I went to a, well, actually, uh, uh, me and uh, Chauncey Eagleston, he was one of the deacons over at Sunset, we, they asked us to do the men's retreat, to present the lessons. I was like, well, that ain't much of a retreat for us. Yeah. <laughs> but so we present the lessons, and we do the men's retreat, and there is a, there is a, a, a retired preacher there. He says, hey, have you ever thought about preaching? I said, I said, well, when I was younger, I said, I wanted to be a priest when I was a Catholic. I said, but I kind of like the ladies. And so that kind of, you know, kind of ruined it for me. So I just kind of said, well, that's by the wayside. And so, so it never really, nothing ever came of it. So I went home and I told my wife, I said, hey, they said, have I ever thought about preaching? You might have the gift for preaching. She goes, I didn't sign up for that. <laughs> well, that, that is very true. Yeah. Because you don't stand alone. Yeah, Your you wife is with you every moment of a preacher's life. Yeah. But we still have individual responsibilities. Yeah, we have individual responsibilities. Yeah. I didn't excuse that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm talking about the importance of yeah. your wife. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. But she was like, I didn't sign up for that. <laughs> and if you know Christy, that's exactly what she said. But the, 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 the funny thing was, though, like I said, as I grew and matured in faith by the men who were mentoring me, then eventually they were like, hey, do you want to do Bible study in the auditorium? Hey, do you want to do men's retreat? Hey, do you want to? And then it's, they were slowly, without even me fully knowing what was going on, they were slowly bringing me along for further works that I was going to do in the kingdom down the road that I wasn't even fully aware of yet. And so 
that's why I used to tell people, I said, if you would have told me early on in my faith that you were going to be a preacher, I probably would have laughed at you. And, and I say that because, well, I just, I didn't know what the Lord had in store. So as we grow and mature in our faith, that growth and mature, sure, it comes from reading scriptures, but more of it comes from me, uh, to, in my mind, more of it comes from the sense that, do you, who's mentoring you? Has anybody mentored you? Have you allowed yourself to be mentored? Whose feet do you sit at? I, I name all the time the four guys, you know, I said, uh, Rick and, uh, and Jerry and John and, uh, and Larry. I mention them all the time. Why? Because I've had them in my home lots of times. I've sat at their feet. You know who was another one who was instrumental in my faith? Rick Gilmer's wife, Jerry Gilmer. If you guys ever want to have a fun study, it's, you're going to have to do it over FaceTime. She lives in Florida now. But Jerry, she knew more about the Old Testament, and she loved the study about like the, the temple and the tabernacle and the tent of meeting. And she had that stuff practically memorized. And we used to have our Friday night fellowships, and we were maybe sometimes in the Old Testament. I would sit there and just listen to her at all. Because she had so much, you know, just in-depth knowledge of the of that aspect of the of the old law and the scriptures and what the requirements were. But I say all that to say that, you know, I learned just as much from her. In, in, in some ways that I learned from the other men who were mentoring me. So who's mentoring you? We're about to run out of time and man, we didn't get very far, but it was a good conversation because I'm, hopefully I've given you something to think about. If you're a man or a woman in this congregation, I don't care how long you've been a Christian for, if you haven't never been mentored and you're not being mentored by somebody who's older or maybe more, and it, I actually I take that back, it doesn't even have to be older, somebody who's just more mature. There's sometimes people who come to faith later in life, or sometimes people who've been pew sitters for a while that didn't take their faith as serious, but now, later on, maybe 20 years they've been a member of the church, but now they're taking their faith more serious. Who's mentoring you? It doesn't always have to be an older person. It could be somebody who's younger than you. But who's mentoring you? So I want you to think about that. And if, you, if the answer is, well, I really don't have any Christian mentors that I can think of, what are you going to do about it? I think it's time to find somebody. I think it's time to ask. I can't tell you how many times as a minister I've offered from the pulpit and in Bible study and just write general conversation. Hey, if you're ever interested in studying the word, I'm always trying to pay forward what they do to me, what, what those guys did to me and what they did for me. Very, very rarely has anybody ever taken me up on it. Well, that's the whole point of your lesson this morning is paying it forward. Paying it forward. Just to mention, uh, if you want, if everybody wants to give a little different uh, version of Paul's explanation here in Romans 12 you can go to 1 Corinthians 12 and he gives excellent expose on different members of the church comparing yeah. them to different members of the body Yes, amen. And we all have a function we all have a function, we all have ability, we all have talent, but it begins there, but it doesn't mean your abilities and your talents can't grow and then morph into other things I don't say it in jest when I say I would have laughed at somebody if they told me early on my faith that you'd be preaching the scriptures, you'd be preaching the gospel, and moving your family from Dearborn to Iowa, you know, if they would have told me that early in my faith. I probably would have laughed at you because my life was very different in the, early, in the early part of my faith. But, again, it was because I allowed myself to be mentored. Who's mentoring you? Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, gracious Heavenly Father, we love you. We are so blessed to be able to have your word to guide us in spirit and truth. Father, we are so thankful for Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, your Son. We're so thankful for the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures that guide us in life and godliness. Father, I pray that each of us that were here this morning, and each of us that are here every time the, uh, there's an opportunity for studying your word, I pray that all of us, Father, can look to either be mentored by somebody and or mentor somebody. I pray, Father, that we could have an influence on the lives of those around us with our spiritual knowledge, on our spiritual, with our spiritual gifts, and with all the abilities that you have granted us. Father, I pray that we use those to your glory. I pray that we use those to the furtherance of the kingdom, for the church is desperate need of those who would look to seek and save. The church is in desperate need of those uh, who would look to mentor, influence others. And I pray that you would put that on our hearts in this coming week, to think on these things. I pray that you would uh, put it on our hearts, Father, to uh, 
to ask for help if we need help in understanding the scriptures and uh, understanding uh, all that, uh, that, your, that your teachings teach us. And I just pray, Father, a special blessing this morning uh, as I was talking to our sister Sherry and her husband Roger, who's not doing well uh, with, his, with the infections. He has another surgery that's coming up to, to, to help clean out the infection. Um, and I just pray, Father, for his health, his strength to be restored. I pray that you guide the, the doctors and the medical team that are treating him. Uh, and I pray that they do their jobs to the best of their ability and that your providential care will be with them and be with beyond uh, Roger as he is uh, in need of this blessing. Father, we have uh, an extensive prayer list. I pray that you would uh, send a special blessing to each of those individuals uh, that are either our members or connected to our members. Bless them, Father, in a, in a manner of which they need. And I pray that these blessings always align with your will. Father God, we pray that as we get ready to worship you here this morning, that our worship is acceptable in your sight. It's in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.